Hello and welcome. Um, I'm excited to introduce Matthew Meyer Bolton, who I've known about but never met. Um, a lot of my friends go to the call program and have enjoyed him and his classes. Um, I'm going to just remind those on Zoom that you can put your questions in the chat function and we'll make sure to answer those. And those of you in person, um, Matthew will repeat your question after you ask it so that those on Zoom can hear it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you, you, you hear me all right? I need to uh, apologize for my voice. I had my booster, which I encourage all of us to do. I had my booster on Thursday night. Yesterday was fine. Today I've got a sore arm and a funny voice. So I apologize for that. Uh, but this will be a romp. Uh, it'll be a nice compliment to Clara's uh, presentation, focusing on a micro, right? That's what Clara was doing. We're going to focus on the really, really big picture. So away we go. Um, this is a, a beautiful image of Mount Mananak, uh, painted by Abbott Thayer, the accomplished artist who lived in Dublin, and of course, the City of Keene official seal. Today's presentation, we'll do a little bit of work on underpinnings, then a, a very brief uh, cosmic beginnings, and then do five case studies. So the mountain, the people, the name Keen, the wild, uh, Thoreau will help us with that, and then the arts, beautiful arrangements. So uh, the underpinnings will give us a sense of why we're doing this romp, and uh, let's dive into that. So. This is, of course, the sense of place uh, portion of the conference, or this, this column of presentations has to do with sense of place. The argument here is that uh, to have a sense of place, you need the micro and you need the macro. You need to zoom in and you need to zoom out. The other side of the argument is you need the arts and the sciences, so is my contention. You should not think of arts and sciences. We shouldn't think of them as disjunctive, but rather as complementary, almost like two uh, lenses that we look through in a pair of eyeglasses so we can see the world in three dimensions and in crisp clarity. You can call this approach a kind of deep local history. We'll be peeling back the layers uh, of this place that we're trying to get a sense of. And then it all turns on affection. That is a line from E.M. Forrester, the great novelist, uh, basically saying that, you know, we need to fall in love with a place. Uh, we can fall in love with the Cairngorm Mountains in the Highlands of Scotland, like Nan Shepherd did, or fall in love with the uh, uh, province lands just north of Provincetown, like the poet Mary Oliver did, or we can fall in love with the forests and farms of Kentucky, like Wendell Berry did. Berry's argument is that in this uh, very interesting and fascinating essay, is that moral, it, it is right to conserve places, but moral rightness will never be enough. That motivation isn't strong enough. Love is the stronger motivation. Affection is the stronger motivation. So we're going to try to fall in love just a little bit more with Keene and the Monadnock region in the next 18 minutes. Uh, and by the way, love doesn't mean turning a blind eye to the faults of the area, quite the contrary. So that's the underpinnings. Uh, now we continue the romp through cosmic beginnings. This is uh, the most astonishing photograph perhaps in human history. This is 1995, the Hubble te uh, telescope peers at a tiny patch of dark sky and sees uh, none of this is, a, well, there might be a couple of stars, but almost all those specks are not stars, they are galaxies. Okay. Now, when we think about stars, what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at nuclear fusion reactions. That's what a star is. When we catch sight of our sun, you know, don't look at the sun, but if you catch sight of the sun, uh, what you're seeing is a nuclear fusion reaction, hydrogen being turned into helium. So a star is essentially a crucible. It is creating elements. Every element in this room, except for maybe the hydrogen, which was there from the beginning, was created in a star or in a uh, star explosion. So in a large star, you can create all kinds of elements all the way up to iron, but to get to a heavier element than iron, like gold, let's say, you have gold in your body, by the way. You also might have gold on your finger or gold around your neck. How do you create through nuclear fusion 
an atom that has 80 protons, a star isn't strong enough to do that, but a star explosion is strong enough to do that. That's, of course, supernova. The other thing that creates a lot of those heavier metals is uh, neutron stars colliding with each other. So it's pretty cool that, you know, you think about your wedding ring or whatever coming from a neutron star uh, colliding with another neutron star. That's where those things come from. So when that happens, when those explosions happen, that creates ever more enriched clouds or of dust out of which new stars are created. So this is actually an image uh, through a telescope of a star system, a young star system. This is kind of like what we looked like about 4.5 billion years ago. And you see those dark rings around the star forming in the middle of that disk. Those dark rings are the little spheres of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, gold, that will turn into a planet, just like ours. Uh, when you, much smaller scale, of course, but just like the sun inside the earth, the pressures create heat. If it's a rocky planet like ours, you get a nice crust on the outside. The crust is primarily in the land masses, not under the sea, but in the land masses, is primarily granitic or granite. And uh, it's not much volume of the planet, but it is where we live, it's what we know. And of course, it's not one continuous piece, it's tectonic plates. Tectonic just comes from the Greek word for structure or carpentry. So it is uh, plates that are moving over the mantle. The mantle is not liquid, it's solid, but over the long haul, it, it can behave like a liquid. When those plates crash, they crumple. And we call those crumples mountains. Okay, now we're getting closer to home. When we look at New Hampshire's mountains, what are we looking at? We're looking at the roots of ancient Acadian Mountains. These are the Himalayas. The Acadian Mountains may not have been as tall as the Himalayas. They might have been more like the Andes, but we should picture a mountain range like this around here a long, long time ago. And when that happens, partly because of the collision itself, but also because of the weight, the sheer weight of the mountains, you get a lot of action underneath in what's called the roots of the mountains. A lot of metamorphosis, a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, a lot of crazy stuff goes on. You guys may know this spot climbing up the mountain. This is the Smith Summit Trail. You know this spot, the Billings Fold. You see that? that there is a, a pattern in the rock of folding over the rock. Imagine how much pressure, how much heat was necessary to fold that. You can go see that next time you climb the mountain. But that's how heavy, that's how much more metamorphosis was going on beneath the Acadian Mountain Range. So there's the Acadian Mountains on the left, uh, and there's the rock, metamorphic rock, underneath, down in the roots, that's going to become Monadnock, right? So this is 175 million years ago. Fast forward 170 years, and you get Monadnock, the only thing standing. The only thing standing, at least around here, uh, why? why? I mean, in a way, the big story here is that mountain range, where did it go, right? And the answer is, of course erosion, weather and wind and ice, but metamorphic rock is harder than the sedimentary rock. There used to be an ocean here, and that sand and mud became, through all that pressure and all that heat, quartzite and schist, and that's what we're scrambling over when we climb an adnock, primarily, is schist and quartzite. So, when we look at the mountain, we tend to think of the mountain as the presence of a mountain. And that's fine. We should think of the Mount Monadnock as a tenacious remnant. But we should also think about what's not there. That's In a way, that's the headline, right? Is that that whole mountain range went away. So it's an experience of absence. So the next time you see Monadnock on the horizon, like we do all the time, right? We go shopping, we catch sight of Monadnock. We can think of it as a presence, but also as, a, as an absence. And the next time you're on the uh, bare summit of Monadnock looking out over the view, don't only think of it as a view. In a way, the story is all that empty space. It used to be this incredible mountain range, and that mountain range is gone. That uh, That's really one of the marvels of the natural world is how much dynamism there is, and erosion is part of that dynamism. Now, since we're on the bear summit here, let's ask the question, why is it bare? It shouldn't be bare. It's not high enough, right? There are mountains that are higher that have trees right over the top. So here's what uh, Patrick Hummel, the former park manager of Mananoc State Park, says. You may have heard a rumor about why Mananoc is bare, but uh, Mr. Hummel is going to disabuse you of that, of that impression. It wasn't an 1820 fire set by farmers to drive out wolves. Have you heard that story? 
uh, that a lot of people have heard that story. A lot of people believe that. But Hummel is persuaded, and I'm persuaded by him, uh, there's good historical evidence that the summit was already there by 1780. We've got uh, uh, journals uh, to that effect. So the fact that Mananak is bare is likely due to natural fires and then storms that might have swept away the burned debris. So we can set that apocryphal story to rest, but it is widely believed, including by Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau didn't help. Uh, he actually spread that fake news himself. So uh, Mananak is a tenacious remnant. But what about granite, right? We're the granite state. So where does granite come into this story? Uh, it's all over the place in the story. Of course, it's the most common bedrock on earth. So we had a lot of granite quarries primarily because of exposure. Um, half of New Hampshire's exposed bedrock is granite. What is the instrument of exposure? What exposed it? Glaciation exposed it. So the, the glaciers are a huge part of the story of this region. Here are the striations or striations over the face of the mountain. This is also on Monadnock. You can see the you know, the evidence of the glacier scraping rock and boulder over the face there. You can see those as you climb. This is 20,000 years ago, the Laurentide Ice Sheet. You can see it got down to about Long Island Sound. About 15,000 years ago, it had retreated, melted, right? When a, a glacier retreats, it doesn't pick up its bags and walk away. It melts. So you get lakes often, or certainly runoff and rivers, but you often get lakes. This is an example of the Muir Glacier in Alaska because the climate change and stuff is happening all the time all around us. But this is more or less what it looked like around here when that glacier left. There was a lake. Uh, when you take away the political boundaries and look at our uh, region, one of the things that really jumps out is the Connecticut River Basin, right? That's really a really important thing about where we are. Uh, and that used to be, before it was a river, it was a, it was a lake that was known as the, uh, I mean, retrospectively known as Lake Hitchcock. And then if you look really close, you can see another lake. You see that little lake there? That one is Lake Ashwilet. So that is the lake that used to be here. That's why Keene is flat. That's why the soil is sandy. Lake Ashwilet is gone, but of course, the Ashwilet River is here. It's one of the major tributaries of the Connecticut River. So when we take a step back, Keene is part of this broader Connecticut River Valley system. It's got a tilt in a way. It's a tilt toward Long Island Sound. So when we look out at Keene, we can feel it with our imaginations that it's tilting that way. You pour out a glass of water, that water, we can imagine it making its way into the Ashwila, then making its way into the Connecticut River, then making its way out to uh, Long Island Sound. The, the movement of water is a big part of where we are. And so here's my one of my appeals to you, and that is to think about the Ashwilet River, River as the heart of your life. That's why you're here. That's why we're here. When we look at the history of human settlements because of the river, a lot of us, my sense is anyway, we think of the Ashwilet as sort of the back door of the city, you know, like, oh, we catch a glimpse of it here, we catch a glimpse of it there, but it's a big part of life here, human life, non-human life, big part of the history of power in this area, right? Water power, hydropower. It's the aorta. If you want to have a sense of place around here, you got to get to know the Ashwilet. 64 miles long, big watershed, 25 towns in that watershed, and of course, a source of natural beauty. So find ways to intentionally fall more in love with the Ashwilet River. By the same token, we live in a glacial sculpture garden, right? We already talked about the valley. We talked about the soil. We can also talk about the erratics, right? Those boulders that are picked up or broken off by the glaciers, and then when they melt away, they drop them. Here's the sarcophagus uh, uh, glacial erratic up on the Pompeii Trail on Mount Monadnock. Some of you have seen that, or my kids have climbed up on it. I don't know about yours, or if you have kids. Uh, we live at the same time when that glacier retreats, uh, Homo sapiens show up. So we live in a long-standing human habitat. And Dakina, you know, that's the Abenaki word for the broader region of which we are a part. It means loosely our home or our, our homeland. There's evidence of indigenous presence that goes back thousands of years. This, these petroglyphs are in Bellows Falls. Anybody have, has anybody laid eyes on these petroglyphs? That's a cool trip to take there. It's not too hard to find in Bellows Falls. Here is a 9,000 year old fish dam or the remnants thereof. It's a pretty cool design, uh, this, this V-shaped fish dam. 
the fish coming up river, so it might be shad or it might be salmon, would be forced to the riverbank where you could set up shop and net or spear the fish on the riverbank. And then at a different time of year, the eel coming down river would be forced toward the V of that dam. And you could set up shop right at the V and trap the eel. So you can use this dam at different times of year, pretty ingenious construction. A lot of you know the work of Robert uh, Goodby at Franklin Pierce. He's a, a, a wonderful uh, archeologist and observer of the native presence here. If you haven't read this book, you should. Came out relatively recently, and the Harris Center is a big uh, part of, of that, of making that happen. And it's a really important book. Um, we are in a hub. You know, there we are, a hub of waterways. You've got the Shwilat coming in, you've got the Miniwawa, you got Otter, Otter Brook. So a Shwilat itself, you find different translations, but it means something like land between places or land between waters, where you sometimes see gathering waters or waters coming together. Um, so these are um, different possibilities for how we uh, translate that term. Here's the famous tenant uh, swamp camp. There's Robert Goodby himself. So 13,000 years old, the oldest human settlement in New England. And it's right in our backyard, right? It's right by the middle school. So if you haven't visited it yet, you can. And of course, the Abenaki were not just long ago and far away. They are part and are still part of the history of the region. Here's Israel Sadiki's uh, ad. He was a, a basket maker and a tanner on set up shop on Elm Street in Keene. And then, you know, this uh, mural right near the circle, that's Molly Mason Keating, a descendant of the Sadiki family. So speaking of uh, natives, a couple hundred yards from here, there's a boulder, and here it is. It's got a plaque on it. It's where the old fort was around which Keene developed. Supposedly, it is a refuge from the Indians, according to the plaque. Now, what does that mean? Well, what was going on was the French and Indian Wars. A very strange name for that conflict. What it really was was a world war of colonial uh, contest between France, Great Britain, and Spain, trying to jockey for access to exploitation of uh, natural resources. What natural resources? Fur trade, timber trade, sugar trade. We all learn in school that the, uh, Brit the Brits had 13 colonies, right? No, they had 26 colonies. Even, it depends how you count, they had colonies up in uh, Canada, down in the Caribbean, involved in sugar, involved in molasses, and that means involved in slavery. So who's this guy? First uh governor he goes bankrupt in 1733 before he was governor because of a conflict with spain keep that in mind keep spain in your mind as a governor he was uh let's say creative or maybe corrupt he would name new towns after influential contemporaries to curry favor edinburgh is named after a prominent land speculator Rutland after the third Duke of Rutland, Richmond after the third Duke of Richmond, he had the thing for third Dukes, I guess, Bennington after himself to curry favor with himself, I guess. Now, who's this? This is British ambassador to, wait for it, Spain. Hmm. Likely helped Wentworth with his financial crisis in the 1730s, and in any case had considerable international influence. Who is this guy? Benjamin Keene, talented diplomat, Peace treaty uh, broker. I mean, he's this. He's got some really nice and really nice resume. Officer of the South Sea Company. That means he was involved in transatlantic enslavement. So, what do we think about this name of this town, Keene? On the one hand, it's an attempt to curry favor. And on the other hand, you know, you've got this, uh, you know, this guy involved in slavery and imperialism. But here comes the defense. The defense says, "Wait, Wentworth." established the town meeting. He is a pioneer of democracy. And Keene, for his part, he was a public servant and an ambassador of peace. So the question is, is it a good name or a bad name? Do we, do we emphasize this side of the equation or do we emphasize that side of the equation? My argument is both. It's a granite name. It has flecks of light and flecks of shadow in it. And we should remember both whenever we hear the word keen. We should remember the, the, the positive side of that legacy and the negative one. Speaking of international life, uh, walk past Margaritas and you are walking past the childhood home of Cynthia Dunbar, the mother of Henry David Thoreau. 
She was born in Keene in 1787, daughter of Asa Dunbar, who was a rabble rouser himself. They leave in 1798 when she's 11. So the majority of her childhood is spent in Keene, and she is a lover of nature. She inculcates that love of nature in her children, including in Henry, and she's very close to Henry throughout their lives. In fact, he dies in her home at a relatively young age. She was an abolitionist involved in the Underground Railroad. I like to think of her as influencing him all the way from civil disobedience to love of nature. So here's uh, his idea of New Hampshire. I long for wildness, a nature which I cannot put my foot through, woods where the wood thrush forever sings. And then we skip to the end, a New Hampshire everlasting and unfallen. I think we should make t-shirts. Let's say a New Hampshire everlasting and unfallen. Now, he's not the only literary type figure. I'll wrap up here in one minute. I know my time's almost there. Uh, Samuel Clemen Clemens, Mark Twain, summers in Dublin for two summers. He says, the atmosphere is exceptionally bracing. Good for work, he says. Uh, who invited him was Abbott Thayer, that great painter that we started with. Here's Raphael Pompelli, the geologist. Pa Twain says, gosh, this place is great. You got paint, you got literature, you got science, law, morals, You're talking about Dublin Lake. So this is really the part of the history of the region that has to do with second homes or summer homes, elite and intelligent and, you know, uh, 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 folks who are movers and shakers in society gathered around the lake. You know the McDowells, right? The McDowell colony, now, well, now called McDowell because of the connotations of the word colony. Uh, 6,000 artists, 61 Pulitzer Prize winners. Pretty good, right? Here's one of them, Willa Cather. She actually didn't like it at, at McDowell, but she loved it in Jaffrey. She would go every fall friend had some property. She sent up a tent. See that tent in the background? She'd write in that tent in the mornings and then in the afternoons ramble across the schist in the courtside of Monadnock. She wrote some of her most famous work right here in Jaffrey. Here she is with her sweetheart in Jaffrey Center. That's where they're buried. That's where they decided to be buried. So why did all these artists come? Proximity to Boston the shadow of urbanization moving away from cities, the call of the natural world, and the search for our town, right? Thor Thornton Wilder, another person who spent time at McDowell for old home days. Old home days are pioneered in New Hampshire. It was a real estate play, but we can talk about that later. So a sense of place, it turns on affection. We need to develop, or I'm, I'm suggesting that we want to develop a genuine patriotism of realistic respect and restoration, seeing a beautiful arrangement, the cosmos in the common. That's what cosmos means. That's a Greek word. It means beautiful arrangement on New Hampshire everlasting and unfallen. That's a romp. It's over. Thank you very much. So maybe one or two questions or whatever. We have time. I know we don't have much time. I will repeat the question or the comment. I won't repeat the, maybe we'll repeat the comment so people can hear it. Any questions or comments? I know we got to move on with the conference. Okay, yeah. Anybody have a question or a comment? Yes. One. Um, I, I wanted to maybe with a comment while I'm talking. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to uh, go back to your comment about the French, English, I'm sorry, French Indian Wars. Yeah. I think those are better set in the context of the Anglo Wabeniki Wars, which yeah, sure. for you know, a century. And I think it's important to also give key that sort of agency that they were actively fighting wars for 100 years on this land. Yeah, that's good. Colonization. So it's not just the, there's also a proxy war going on, which I, I appreciate, but I think it's also really important to articulate that these were, there were six um, anglo Beniki wars. I think it's really important. Yes, multiple wars. I mean, these alliances made a lot of sense, you know, for, for the Abenaki or the Abenaki, it makes a lot of sense to, to uh, ally with the French. But there was also uh, a real agency there and a real struggle that it's good to remember. It wasn't just being rolled over by European powers. Hopefully my answer summarized the question too so people can hear it. But any other you know, comments or questions? Two comments. One, you talked about um, falling in love with the Ashwheelit River and yeah. for us to realize that that's the heart and aorta of this area. And I yeah. have to give a shout out to Barbara Scully who for how many years has um, headed an Ashwila River a monitoring project. Yeah. Data about the river. So if you're interested in that, Barbara's up in that corner. And she did not know I was going to say this. Yes. 
So a monitoring project for the, I'm just repeating, monitoring project about the river that Barbara has, has set up and that we can get involved with and find out more about. So that's awesome as a way of, for umpteen, umpteen years. And secondly, I just want to say this was a fabulous presentation. Okay. I'm so glad it's recorded because I have to listen to it again. Yeah, to absorb. I know the romp, the romp. I, I totally understand. Very much. Well, thank you. That's probably a good note to end on. Thanks all. Appreciate it.